Hi, I'm Kyla. And I'm Maria. Thanks for learning with us today. Let's dive into today's topic, stream stressors, impacts, and restoration. Hopefully you remember that last time we talked about what it takes to make a good habitat for salmon. Today we're going to quickly review that material and then we'll take a look at some of the things that make for bad habitat. We'll review some common stressors on freshwater habitats and talk about how we can restore those habitats to be healthy again. So now let's take a moment to think about the habitat components that we described last time and how they relate to what salmon need to survive. And we'll come back in a few minutes to discuss our next topic. From the last video, we learned that salmon need habitat complexity. They look for a good mixture of riffles, pools, and glides. Of course, salmon need to have good sources of food in the stream too, like insects living in the riparian habitat or feeding on LWD in the stream. Do you remember what LWD stands for? That's right, large woody debris. Salmon can also feed on brown algae in the stream, which grows naturally on boulders, cobbles, and LWD. Finally, salmon need cover from the hot sun and protection from predators. This can also come from in-stream LWD and from overhanging vegetation in the riparian buffer. Did you come up with anything else? There are many ways that freshwater salmon habitat is impacted by activities from within the watershed. Can you think of some examples of stressors that could impact our streams, rivers, and creeks? Excellent work. Let's see if we had the same answers. Here are some stressors that could impact freshwater habitats. Barriers to fish passage from blockages and structures, climate change effects like drought and flooding, lack of riparian habitat, forestry, agriculture, industry and associated pollution, sedimentation from landslides, as well as runoff that flows off nearby roads straight into streams. What are some ways that these can impact salmon? Take a moment to think about this and then we'll take a closer look at some of these stressors. One barrier to fish migration are perched culverts. So when there's a stream and there has to be a roadway above it, they channelize the stream below ground and use culverts so that way the water can move through. However, under high flows, sometimes the water can come down and scour below the culvert and that will lower the elevation and make it more difficult for fish to actually travel through. Climate change is impacting salmon in all their life stages. So you can think about, let's say, warmer stream temperatures. And sometimes that becomes so warm that they can't survive. So changes in climate also result in changes to river flows. When there's precipitation that falls more in the form of rain rather than snow, you can think about flash flooding or the potential for landslides. This can reroute channels altogether. And if there's high flows, it will scour the sediment that's there for spawning if there's landslides, there might be increased sedimentation. And during the summer months, the river flows will be a lot lower. And so fish can get stranded. And often they have to wait for rivers to rise before going to spawn. When substances get washed into streams from nearby areas, we call that runoff. When it rains, the water rushes over hard surfaces like roads, patios, and buildings picking up pollutants along the way. For example, there's agricultural runoff, like chemical fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides, or animal waste that washes off of farm fields. When excess nutrients enter the stream from fertilizer runoff, this can cause too much algae to grow. When riparian vegetation like shrubs and trees are removed, 
The stream banks are susceptible to erosion because there are no roots to hold onto the soil and provide stability. The lack of vegetation also increases stream temperatures, reducing shade, and making the stream too hot for salmon. The same goes for landslides, which can be caused by vegetation removal and forestry activities. During rainstorms, water flowing over the bare or disturbed land can carry sediment into the creeks and streams below, which causes turbid or cloudy water for juvenile salmon. Let's dive a bit deeper into the issue of excess sediment. As we talked about last time, stream beds are made up of different sized particles like silt, sand, and rocks. Have you ever wondered if the water is supposed to be dirty? Well, that's exactly what it is. Dirt or sediment being carried by the current. As rivers flow, they pick up fine particles and carry them downstream. We can describe waters that look muddy from carrying sediment as turbid. This is a natural process in large rivers like the Fraser River. And we can compare the muddiness of the water or how easily light shines through it by its turbidity. Well, if it's natural for large rivers to be turbid, why is it an issue in smaller streams? If smaller streams are very turbid, it could indicate that there was an erosion event where a big pulse of sediment entered the stream, like a landslide maybe. If the water is turbid in a stream or where salmon spawn, it could be bad news for those fish. The suspended sediment can clog their gills and make it difficult for them to find suitable spawning material in the channel. Salmon eggs can even get buried with fine sediments and they can get suffocated because oxygen can't flow past the clogged up sediment. When there isn't as much good habitat for spawning, this increases competition for those spawning gravels. With too many fish trying to deposit their eggs in the same place, reds can get disturbed and eggs can even get buried by another salmon. A secchi disc is a tool that scientists use to test water turbidity. Try it out in your local watershed. Slowly lower the secchi disc into the water until you can't see the difference in colors on the disc. Hold your fingers to mark the point on the rope and measure the length. This is the depth where this occurred. Remember that inputs of sediment can vary throughout a watershed. Try measuring turbidity at a few different points to see how turbidity varies. So what can we do about it to fix those impacted habitats? Well, there is a whole branch of science called ecological restoration that is focused on doing exactly that. We can help ecosystems recover after they've been impacted in many different ways. Some examples of ecological restoration include stabilizing the slope through riparian planting and live staking, planting riparian vegetation for shade and food, installing LWD structures, replacing migration barriers or creating a fishway, and diverting pollution or runoff. But before any restoration activities take place, it's important to identify what caused the impacts in the first place and fix those. These could include better forestry practices to reduce unnatural sediment load or removing barriers that prevent natural water flow. Taking these steps first can help these ecosystems be self-sustaining and resilient into the future. Let's review. What happens when riparian areas are removed? The impacts to streams are that, without the shade of the riparian plants, stream temperature can increase. Without the roots of the riparian plants holding the soil together, the stream bank can erode and cause sediment loading issues. This can make this a stressful place for a salmon to live. It's too warm, it offers less food in the way of terrestrial insects, and it can cause issues with turbidity. So what can we do about this? As restoration ecologists, we could focus on replanting the riparian area to increase stream shading 
and stabilize the banks. This will also help the water temperature. One method that is sometimes used is called live staking, where cuttings of trees like red osier dogwood and black cottonwood are stuck into the sediment at the stream banks. Cuttings of these trees will naturally take to the soil and drink up the water from the stream to help them grow into full-grown trees. This will help by providing shade to the stream and stabilize the bank with the tree's roots. There's a lot of potential fish migration barriers that they face, especially when they're going up to try to spawn. So what can we do to help these fish as they're trying to make their way back? Well, one thing we could do is to replace perched culverts. One method is using an open bottom culvert. It allows for easy access by salmon and also maintains the natural stream bottom. You can also replace the culvert entirely. And if there's larger issues with barriers like dams, we can make sure to add fish ladders or fishways. Sometimes stream banks are intentionally straightened or debris like LWD is removed. But as we learned, salmon love complex habitat and they need a good ratio of pools to riffles, plus habitat for spawning and resting. But those features are lost when streams are intentionally straightened. As restoration ecologists, we can add complexity back into the stream with something called LWD structures. These structures are made up of large boulders and or large wood, and then they're placed back into streams to encourage changes in sediment transport, which helps add back complexity. When the stream has to flow around these structures, it will naturally create scour pools that become excellent refuge areas for salmon. Now it's time for an activity. Kyla and I recorded stream temperature at two streams over the course of a day each hour. So we want you to graph those data sets and compare them. Is there anything you notice? Did you notice whether there's any stressors or impacts in the photos that we had discussed earlier? So we want you to match the data set with the picture. We hope you enjoyed today's lesson. See you next time. <laughs>